Hi, everybody. Welcome to Shasad Podcast, conversations between scholars from around the world who study childhood, youth, and related institutions historically. As an official production of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, you can subscribe to these shows through iTunes or Google Play. Written and visual materials associated with each episode are available at our website, shcy.org. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our conversation about a recent addition to the literature on juvenile justice history. Um, the title is The Ages of An Anxiety, Historical and Transnational Perspectives on Juvenile Justice, which came out with New York University Press in 2018. Today, I'm going to be talking to the two editors, uh, Professors William S. Bush and um, David S. Tenenhouse. I'm your host, Tara Myers, from the History Department at the University of British Columbia. And I'm also the president of the Society for the History of Children and Youth. And as it turns out, a juvenile justice scholar as well. I'm the author of Caught, Montreal's Modern Girls and the Law, and more recently, Youth Squad, um, uh, Policing Children in the 20th Century. I'm also delighted to confess that I am a contributor to this volume. And so um, I'm delighted um, to be here. So let me introduce my colleagues. Bill Bush is professor of history at the Texas A&M University, San Antonio. And David um, Tenenhaus is professor, Lindsay Rogers, professor of history and law at the William S. Boyd School of Law, University of Las Vegas, and the author of Juvenile Justice in the Making and the Constitutional Rights of Children on the Galt Decision. So hi, Bill. Hi, David. Hi, uh, nice to see you. Welcome, welcome. So I love the title of this book, Age, The Ages of Anxiety. So can you tell us, um, to, to begin this conversation, how you arrived at the book title and what it says about the intentions that you had uh, behind making it, pulling it together, and how it reflects um, your thinking about juvenile justice history today or in the past? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh... Uh, with the response to that. Um, uh, our thinking in, in uh, the title, as you may have guessed, it's kind of a double entendre. Uh, uh, so ages of anxiety, of course, refers to the ages of the youth uh, that we study. Uh, and it also refers to a uh, sort of periodization that we're trying to introduce into this discussion, uh, that there are these sort of different ages, uh, especially in the, the last century, century and a half or so, uh, in which anxieties about youth and about uh, childhood and coming of age uh, have really taken particular shape uh, in different ways in different societies uh, around the world. Uh, and so that's sort of succinctly what we had in mind with that title, was trying to pull together those two strands. Great. Great. So this book does several, several important things, um, but two obvious ones are in the subtitle. Uh, it leans into the transnational turn and also provides a historical account of how ideas about youth and juvenile justice are borne out. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, why the transnational turn um, interested you at this particular moment in time. You both do American-centered, US-centered scholarship, but this book really does an interesting um, job of, of um, opening up a lot of the ideas that were circulating in the US with those that were circulating um, in places as, as far afield as Zanzibar, Montreal, um, and so on. Uh, David uh, or me? Yes, well, uh, a couple of things. So uh, the idea for the for the volume was Bill, so I'll let him uh, talk about that. But I do have a couple of things I'd like to say about the transnational uh, component that I think uh, both of us as 
you know, professional historians as we saw developments in how uh, people were rethinking America and the world uh, became very interested in uh, transnational history. And this volume gave us the opportunity to read deeply in that literature. So I think it was exciting. Uh, a colleague of mine at UNLV in the history department, Kean uh, McMahon, uh, who is a, a transnational historian, uh, gave us a, a really important reading list early in the in the project, and then uh, Bill and I worked through that material, which was helpful. And then, in addition, this volume followed up on one that uh, was already published in this series with NYU Prep on, on youth crime and justice that Frank Zimmering and I edit. And we had done a volume with Maximo Langer, who's a wonderful comparative criminal law scholar uh, called um, Juvenile Justice and Global Perspective. There was largely uh, law professors looking at the development of these systems, trying to come up with a, a broader uh, map of how to understand the development of these systems. And they um, wrote an essay that was championing the idea of thinking about maturation as a real rationale for juvenile justice systems, um, challenging older ideas that these systems need to fix or change youth, but really the kind of core idea of juvenile justice is giving people the opportunity to grow up without being harmed by interventions. So as um, Frank Maximo and I were finishing that volume, uh, Bill presented this really kind of fascinating uh, proposal for a volume that would look at uh, this transnational exchange of ideas and through the lens of social history, which was very different from anything we'd done uh, in the series. But I'll turn uh, things to, to Bill to talk a little bit about the, the genesis of this particular volume. Sure, thanks, David. And uh, what I can add to that is the idea for this project really goes back, you know, almost seven or eight years uh, to a couple of panel sessions that I was involved in, uh, first at the uh, Social Science History Association uh, annual conference, and then uh, the European Social Science History uh, conference. Uh, and that was within about a year and a half period that I participated in uh, several panel sessions where scholars from different parts of the globe were presenting research on the history of juvenile delinquency and juvenile justice in all of these different settings. And I felt like I had this kind of epiphany uh, where I could see all of these sort of common sets of questions and problems surfacing in very different contexts. Uh, and at that time, there was no volume. There was no sort of synthesis uh, that had really been done yet to, to try and uh, uh, describe uh, what I was sort of intuitively seeing uh, in those panels. And so I started working on that and, and reading as widely as I could in, in uh, the uh, what published scholarship did exist uh, that dealt with juvenile delinquency and transnationalism, which at that time was fairly limited. Uh, and as I was developing that project, uh, these a couple of volumes uh, emerged, the one that David just described and another one uh, called Juvenile Delinquency and the Limits of Western Influence, which emerged out of a, a conference as well uh, and had some uh, uh, participants uh, who I knew already uh, through the sort of network of juvenile justice and juvenile delinquency scholars. Uh, so that's when I formulated a proposal and then brought it to, to David and, and to Frank uh, with the NYU series. Uh, so it took a long time. This was my first experience uh, co-editing a, a book volume, and uh, I would recommend it to anybody who has lots and lots of patience because they do take a long time to bring to fruition. So we may have um, viewers who are not familiar with the general trajectory of juvenile justice. Um, do you want to just um, talk a little bit about um, the ages of anxiety as a periodization and, and what kinds of shifts and developments you're, you're talking about, um, just for, for the uninitiated. Uh, I'll start with a response to that, but I know David is going to have a lot to contribute to this question as well. Um, so within a U.S. context, there's a certain periodization that, that uh, 
American scholars of juvenile justice are very familiar with uh, that really begins with the sort of late Gilded Age and progressive era and the creation of formal mechanisms of juvenile justice, such as the invention of the juvenile court in Chicago at the turn of the 20th century, the development of juvenile probation, separate juvenile detention facilities and children's mental health programming, child guidance centers. Uh, so there's this sort of burst of energy in the progressive era to create a uh, protected childhood, right? To sort of institutionalize protections for children and especially the children of working class immigrants, the so-called new immigrants uh, from Southern and Eastern Europe uh, were kind of the initial focus uh, to the detriment of children from other backgrounds such as African-American children and Latinx children uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, then you have uh, uh, a sort of a, a second uh, administrative turn in the mid 20th century that takes place that I wrote about in my first book in, in Texas uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, and from there you have pendulum swings in the 1960s and 70s towards uh, sort of civil libertarian protections for adolescents uh, and then a get tough turn, uh, a retributive turn. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, the age of the so-called super predator, which we write about in the concluding essay of Ages of Anxiety. Um, and so, you know, looking at those sort of twists and turns in a transnational context, it looks very different. And so um, the first chapter in the book uh, from one of our contributors, David Niger, uh, talks about some of the international institutions that developed uh, in the 1910s and 20s, uh, the International Association of Juvenile Court Judges, uh, League of Nations based organizations, uh, the importance of the Declaration of the Rights of the Child. Uh, uh, and so I'm gonna actually turn that, perhaps that part of the discussion over to David who is more knowledgeable about that than I am. Yeah. So. What, what's interesting about the question about how we break the history of juvenile justice into periods is also uh, the product of which discipline is investigating juvenile justice. So people who have approached these issues from a uh, perspective of law have often told a creation story that Bill mentioned, you know, the kind of 1899 establishment of the, the first uh, court system in Chicago. And then uh, there's a kind of a constitution driven story of the, the Galt Revolution where the Supreme Court in 1967 says that uh, children during adjudicatory hearings have uh, many, if not all, the rights that adults have while, while being, if they were are being prosecuted in an adult court. So there, and then the work of Bill and others, including you, Tamara, has really uh, emphasized how important the mid-century is. And I think one of the contributions of this volume is highlighting the importance of those kind of forgotten middle day middle decades in the in the 20th century uh, so I think that's uh, a real contribution of this volume and then we also try uh, to introduce a theoretical model where you can use social history to try to gauge how you would describe uh, movements uh, in the field of juvenile justice or larger societal concerns about youth. So we became very interested in the work of sociologists writing about moral panics, uh, which has uh, largely been a kind of a 20 and 21st century story. But the one point on periodization that I, I would stress is uh, Earlier events about the history of, of childhood, I think, are enormously important. Uh, so I find, you know, very uh, what impressed me and changed how I thought about uh, larger questions of periodization was Holly Brewer's uh, work on um, an earlier period in Anglo-American history and thinking about the American Revolution is really kind of upending some notions of status and how age uh, becomes a really important category. But I think uh, 
the challenge we face that juvenile justice can be thought of as a very narrow field involving like kind of kids, cops, um, maybe social workers. But what we were uh, interested and what we're excited about in this volume is trying to think of a way of writing either American history, Atlantic history, transnational history, using juvenile justice as a lens to think about really big and important topics uh, in the past, and then how thinking about that history can help us uh, today to kind of remind us not to make mistakes that we see are repeated much too often uh, in, the, in the past. Thanks, yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, uh, Stanley uh, moral panic, so his work dating back to 1972 and David Garland following up and how, how important that's been in uh, sociology, but also in um, our work that, that looks at why did certain um, years or eras really feature a concentration on either crime or on young people. And so um, do you want to take a moment to talk a bit about either the moral panic or that two by two model that you introduce um, in the book to, to look at how it is that um, juvenile justice is produced and, and how they come up with different ideas about um, what is the solution to um, kids that, that, that go back. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, that model really emerged Kind of organically for us from the collection. Uh, we didn't begin the project with that model in mind, uh, so I think that's kind of an important thing to note is that we, we think it'll be useful because of our experience with developing it uh, for historians attempting to make sense of their evidence as they're looking at different, you know, various case studies uh, and trying to make sense of the choices that uh, policymakers make or that uh, uh, various uh, groups in society make in terms of how they portray uh, youth problems, right? And what kinds of solutions do they end up arriving at? And so we think this model helps us make sense of that as to which group of children are really being discussed, right? Are they our children? Uh, are they outside of society? Are they within society? Um, uh, and uh, uh, so I think that's, you know, important. Uh, we think it, it'll be applicable because of the way that we uh, kind of develop the model. Um, and then we apply it in the concluding essay in talking about uh, a couple of different uh, moral panics in history uh, in the U.S. context, uh, as well as, as the European context as well. Yeah, and what I would um, add, and it's really, I think, important that, uh, that Bill stresses uh, the point that you know, the contributors to the volume wrote their essays before our theoretical model existed, but then it helped us organize how we wrote the introduction and concluding chapter. And then the, the point for people who um, are kind of new to the field of juvenile justice is that we have a, a dual system in place where the same kids can be tried for the same crimes in either the juvenile or the adult system. So part of what's interesting about the model is thinking about uh, whether we're talking about our kids or somebody else's kids, whether we're thinking about youthful uh, indiscretions or crime, that can either weaken or strengthen the idea that we would retain a, a separate system to handle the cases of, of adolescence. So for, uh, for us, part of the challenge of this volume was uh, convincing non-historians why social history is useful in thinking about public policy. So the part of what this volume does and what the volume, what the uh, conceptual model does is it allows policy people and others to look at the work of historians and it gives them a way to say, oh, I can see what 
the complexity and challenges of these issues are, that what we're trying to cultivate is a real um, historical sensibility that we can see as a way to prevent people from being blinded by, by, the, by the present. So the, the model works, I think it's helpful both for historians and then um, people outside of the field of history who might be skeptical about why would I want to read about Zanzibar? Uh, why would I be interested in what happened in Turkey in the late 20th century? That we're showing that the, the, the problems and issues are the same. The context, is, the context changes, but uh, the goal of all of this is to get us to uh, remember some first principles of uh, juvenile justice, which is the idea that the children and adolescents are different from adults and also not to uh, begin to uh, think that uh, the children somehow are so radically different and dangerous today that uh, we've never thought these things before, that we need to act in, in very defensive, aggressive uh, ways. And part of what I found uh, useful, and I'd be interested uh, whether Bill shares this, is when we, um, as American citizens, were horrified by the, the caging of, of children um, you know, in our, in our borderlands, uh, I think for us, using the model and drawing on some of the things in the book gave us a way to um, try to come to terms with the kind of regime that we were living in and what was being done uh, to children in the, in the 21st century. And Bill, you're living in Texas, that, you know, yeah. you know very, very nearby. Yeah, uh, I completely agree, David. And I can tell you, I've even applied the model in my classes here in South Texas uh, with a student population that is mostly Latinx. And I have undocumented students in my classes or students who have undocumented family members in the country. So it definitely hits close to home for them. And, you know, I've used the model to get them to talk about the uh, uh, child separation policy at the border. And I've asked them exactly the question that you just raised, you know, why do we, why are we outraged about this, right? Like, like, why do we, we just sort of instinctually know that this is wrong, right? And, you know, I argue, well, it's because we've had generations of education that, uh, uh, that children are supposed to be protected from these sorts of, of consequences uh, for actions that they may or may not have, have committed. Uh, and certainly in the case of, of child refugees, it's very hard to even see how that framework completely fits. Uh, but you know, even people who don't have a direct connection to that react in that way, right? And so then the our children, their children dichotomy is also a very useful kind of avenue of discussion for them. And I think it has helped them uh, really think about, uh, you know, how this this current crisis that we're living through uh, can be informed by history uh, and how our response to it can be informed by history. So we sometimes think that um, uh, we'd like that um, history uh, were linear and that things always get better. So a lot of the work that, um, well, that we do, um, sort of demonstrates that in fact, history is not linear. Um, but would you point to a particular moment or particular policies or um, a quadrant on that, in that model um, that perhaps speaks to a time that held hope or that held a kind of um, really embraced a kind of protected notion of childhood that, that we might um, say undergirds um, a society in a more progressive moment? I can think of a couple and I'm sure David can as well. Um, uh, you know, two that come to mind are the sort of uh, civil libertarian turn of the 1960s and early 70s, which David has written about, uh, in which you know, some scholars have suggested that the law of unintended consequences uh, kind of resulted from some of those reforms that were intended to expand the protections for children 
uh, within the legal system and that ended up uh, unintentionally providing legitimation for exactly the opposite in the long run. Uh, we might also look at the development of the more recent uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, from the late 1980s, which the United States played a significant role in developing, but then didn't ratify, didn't join. Uh, and so now with the crisis that's going on at the southern border, that, that failure to follow through for domestic political reasons, essentially, uh, you know, really stands out. And so, you know, one of my current side projects, uh, which really was influenced by my uh, encounters with scholars at the most recent SADY conference in Sydney last summer, mm -hmm. is I'm looking at the, uh, the sort of reparations movement, the redress movements uh, that are going on in other parts of the world and trying to get a sense of how that, 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 we can understand those movements within the, the model that David and I developed uh, in Agents of Anxiety and then maybe try to apply it to the US uh, because I could easily see some kind of a class action situation down the road for the children and the family members uh, who have been put in cages over the last couple of years at the southern border. Uh, and that seems like a potential model uh, for a kind of a redress scheme, a very focused redress scheme. So that's kind of a side project of mine. I was supposed to give a talk on it uh, uh, that got destroyed by COVID-19. Uh, but uh, so it's something I'm working on right now. Yeah, the other thing that I would press and which makes uh, the field of juvenile justice um, in the United States history so interesting is as scholars of the carceral state have you know, examined how our rates of incar incarceration are quintupled between uh, the early 1970s and you know, into the 21st century, uh, one of the remarkable things was, and you know, we've been trying to figure out how to kind of reverse uh, mass incarceration, you know, this, this kind of national nightmare. But within the field of uh, juvenile justice, um, incarceration rates, arrest rates, um, everything dropped by half between 1997 and 2015. So, you know, figuring out this uh, movement, um, you know, part of it were efforts to find all alternatives to uh, detention, uh, rethinking, uh, you know, policy embracing this idea that that kids are are different. There's a really important story that kind of comes after our book ended, analyzing that moral panic of the 1990s. You know, we allude to some of the reasons why uh, the panic ended, but really figuring out uh, what's going on between 1997 and 2015 is enormously important as part of a. Um, book that I'm writing with uh, Maximo Langer, we interviewed about 45 uh, leaders in the field of of juvenile justice, and you know, from the 1970s to the to the present, and one of the questions that you know we asked people who are you know currently running systems or experts was to explain locally what had happened between 97 and 2015, and everyone had a very local and particular explanation for something that looked. Uh, similar across the nation. So part of what we're trying to kind of tease out in our work, and um, Langer is a you know, true in, empiricist, is trying to figure out what you know, tweaks and policies and decision making actually help explain these drops in both arrests and uh, incarceration rates. The early evidence suggested that it wasn't uh, that it didn't apply, you know, across the board, including uh, black and brown children. But some of the uh, more recent data suggests that that, uh, that the incarceration rates dropped across the board. So, you know, in our current work, we're trying to, uh, you know, figure out that 
that story, which is enormously important. And I'll add the 2015 dates enormously important uh, because as part of our work on this, the MacArthur Foundation played an enormous role in pouring resources into adolescent development and juvenile justice reform from uh, you know the mid 90s you know, into the first part of the 21st century, um, all the materials that they uh, developed and planned, they assumed that uh, in 2016, and they were thinking uh, the election would turn out differently, that all of that um, expertise and knowledge was just going to be adopted by uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. But of course, um, things turned out very differently. And part of what we do at the end of the book, it's kind of a cautionary tale about why we should be deeply concerned about uh, President Trump and his long history of uh, kind of real um, punitiveness and anger directed towards uh, youth of color, you know, dating back to, to the 1980s. So part of what, you know, made the book kind of um, hard was when we were ending the world change, you know, before, you know, we're kind of caught up now in the, uh, the COVID-19, but the, there was, you know, for those of us interested in juvenile justice policy, enormous concerns what uh, the 2016 election, um, you know, might mean. Uh, for the field and uh, whether um, science and expertise would be valued, whether we would see this, you know, continuing uh, commitment to trying to develop more child-friendly policies in the United States. And I'll just end by saying, um, as this transition was occurring, I was at a children's rights convention in Ireland where um, one of the people who had litigated the Supreme Court cases that led to the abolition of the juvenile death penalty and life without the possibility of parole sentences being mandatorily uh, imposed, when she described to uh, uh, a largely European audience what practices looked like in the United States, people were gasping. Just they, they and this this was you know at the beginning of uh, you know, the, the new administration and the policy she, were, she was talking about uh, predated, of course, the current administration, but just realizing how uh, the United States in this field is looked at by uh, people in other nations, you know, it's, it's always a startling uh, reminder that um, there is this deep uh, punitive strain in our, in our history that, uh, can lead us to real cruelty to, to children. Right, and um, thank you for um, reminding well, me of um, your wonderful use, wonderful, your, um, um, your use of the Central Park Five case and um, how Donald Trump had um, come out very um, guns blazing against, uh, against these young people and um, and how much that mattered that taking out ads in local newspapers mattered and puts also puts that social history in context when when a population is moved by um, the suspicion and fear and hatred of certain categories of youth um, how it can inform policy but also inform a public that is not very historically minded or very youth conscious. So, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that that really in retrospect looks like one of the sort of opening salvos of the super, pet, super predator panic uh, coming in 1989, uh, you know, a few years before the word was even really popularized. Um, so, absolutely. And, uh, you know, David and I co-authored an op-ed about the family separation policy at the border and we drew on that and then compared some of the comments that Trump made in the 80s to the comments that he had been making uh, about the refugee children at the border, you know, likening them to uh, MS-13 and, and so forth, sort of adultifying them. Uh, and some of them are infants. Uh, so 
So I have a question about um, transnationality and about um, American empire. And um, we're sort of um, happy, grateful that American empire doesn't mean that some of the um, um, the brutality of, um, of policies against children are exported. Um, but on the other hand, um, would you say that um, juvenile justice across, let's say, the modern period um, is is really one of American empire, the exporting of um, of American ideas, or does this book um, maybe inform you um, to think along a different lines so that this is more of a um, a, a true transnational exchange. I'm just wondering where you fall down on that. As a Canadian, I'm always thinking, um, you know, America is the elephant and we are the mice. <laughs> and it's, it's not that we're not independent um, or independent thinkers, and certainly um, we have different um, uh, legal regimes, um, but that there is a lot of um, borrowing because of the productivity of American scholars and um, and experts in the field. So I'm just going to give a very brief answer to that because David has done a lot more research on this this particular topic than I have. But, uh, you know, one thing that that I th jumped out to me as you were asking your question is that the juvenile court in the U.S. to a great extent was inspired by these sort of uh, diasporic populations, right? Uh, that uh, immigrated to the United States and their children coming of age in American cities like Chicago kind of helped inspire uh, the creation of the juvenile court. Uh, and then some of those ideas then kind of made their way back across the Atlantic. And there was, it seems to me, a true exchange between legal scholars, judges, policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and you see it in some of the international organizations that uh, uh, are discussed in the book. Um, and I know some scholars have even referred to the juvenile court as America's greatest legal export, uh, right? Frank and uh, uh, David, I think, have, have said something similar to that. Um, and yet today, America's reputation, the United States' reputation in this area is kind of in tatters, uh, as David just illustrated. Uh, so it's it's an interesting uh, dynamic. I'm not sure it neatly fits into the kind of contours of how we think about empire uh, in some respects. Uh, but I definitely want to turn over to David a little bit to comment further. Yeah, no. So it is really uh, it's interesting to you know as you know as much as you know the transnationalism has become a a method uh, thinking about American history. Uh, through the lens of empire has also uh, been one of the real transformations in the field you know, during my uh, professional career. So there are a couple of ways of, of thinking about it, but once you think about an American empire, um, you have to um, write the experiences of indigenous youth into this the history. So something like uh, the, the very infamous Carlisle uh, school uh, in uh, in you know Pennsylvania, where um, kids were were sent to be Americanized and incredibly high mor mortality rates. Uh, that becomes um, juvenile justice as empire. That once you think of that institution in those terms, uh, when uh, the United States acquires the island empire. Um, they do, if you think about uh, U.S. history and sort of the Daniel Inua, the greater territorial U.S., uh, they do establish juvenile justice system in all of the, whether it's, whether it's Guam, the Philippines. So there is like important work that, that needs to be done then. And even the United States, 1899, uh, their territories within the continental United uh, States, that they're, they're parts that don't uh, become states until 1912. So I think empire and juvenile justice is enormously important. I have a really wonderful graduate student who's writing her dissertation about uh, juvenile justice in the borderlands, that it's really striking and on this question of kind of transnationalism and empire, uh, she uh, does a lot of work uh, with uh, the 
criminologist couple, Sheldon and Eleanor uh, Gluick, and they correspond with people all over the world. And Mexico sends through a program in the State Department an expert to the United States to meet with them. And so she's been going through his uh, you know, public publications. And one of the things that's striking on this kind of empire question is there's there's a history of juvenile justice that tells the kind of traditional America as exporter, Chicago is the creation story. But all the sources this author uses for the Spanish language publication are by Latin American um, experts, including many uh, from Colombia. Uh, so it's this really, so you're telling story that you know, the United States has to be situated at the center, but none of the materials the person's relying on are created uh, by, by Americans or even in English. So there's something powerful. On the question of you know exporting, there's a point where the United States by not adopting the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, not only lost moral leadership, but then became an importer of ideas about uh, children and juvenile justice, so very controversially in the 2005 Roper decision where the court um, abolished the juvenile death penalty. Justice Kennedy um, talks a great deal about uh, about kind of European sensibilities, European decisions, and there's outrage that the Supreme Court would draw on, you know, quote unquote, foreign law to think of what the US Constitution means. And then all of that um, allusion to what's going on elsewhere drops out of the Supreme Court's future decisions. It all becomes brain science, that it's something that, you know, brain science. Uh, is another way of thinking about, well, this is somehow American, that these are, are kids. So there's that really, really interesting uh, tension there about kind of what role the United States um, has to uh, to play. So I think there's pride in the, the kind of the, the original juvenile court ideal, but other countries practice something that's much closer to that ideal than the United States today. Um, I'm just aware of our time is 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 running short, but um, before I ask you my final question about where are we going next, um, I just wonder if there's anything about the book that you would like to share or anything that you would hope um, to get at um, that we haven't touched on. I think we've touched on a lot of the things I was hoping that we would talk about. Uh, the two by two model uh, for moral panics, we think is. Uh, a useful starting point for scholars as they're uh, working their way through source materials and uh, kind of initial questions. Um, and uh, I think that cuts across disciplines as well. Uh, I think that it, it could be a useful model for social scientists as well as for historians and for more historical minded scholars. The only thing I would add is one of my uh, favorite chapters is the Court Decker chapter where something doesn't happen. And that, I think, uh, really reminded me that, you know, historians are really interested, you know, in studying change, creations of institutions, programs. And what was so wonderful about her contribution is there's not a product or an outcome, and that's the story. So we talk about it as, you know, the hound that doesn't bark sometimes really uh, is is the story. So that one I think is, is really, really interesting. And I think she contributed to the most recent American Oracle Review um, issue on thinking about age as a, as a category of analysis. Yeah. yeah, I would I would add the chapter that Sherry Arisic, uh wrote about the Estudio Social in Mexico City is a really fascinating chapter that I think opens up a lot of, of uh, interesting uh, approaches and, and uh, in terms of uh, US-Mexico uh, kind of cross-fertilization because she's looking at uh, the sort of cross-fertilization of juvenile justice experts across the border and then uh, using these sort of social work reports on individual cases uh, in the sort of post-revolutionary Mexico is, is really pretty original. Yeah, awesome. So what's next? Where should we go next? Where should we go next? 
David, you want to take that one first? <laughs> yes. Um, so I, so in thinking about uh, the field of, of juvenile justice itself, uh, like you know, critically important work uh, needs to be done on Latinx youth. That the field bill was part of the, this wave to to really bring um, African American youth. Um, into the history, along with uh, Jeff Ward and, and several others doing that really important work. Uh, Bill, um, in writing about Texas, you know, did some of the first work on Latinx youth. There's some work on California, but th that um, that part of the history, you know, we we definitely need more work on on just on my own front as part of this collaborative um, project with uh, with Maximo Langer uh, what we're doing which hasn't uh, been done in the context I think of, of thinking about juvenile justice is we're um, interested in when Americans really thought of an adversary system as uh, their own and uniquely American, and what happens uh, when you understand an adversary system where you're going to have a uh, defense counsel, but also a prosecutor, uh, this very uh, notion of, of battling this, this out, and then the, the institutional power that prosecutors acquired uh, in the late 20th century is something that we're uh, examining through the lens of, of juvenile justice so as you know part of our project we spent really you know interesting time talking to prosecutors who were part of the group who uh in this you know the so-called get tough era were the people implementing these policies and they um hate being characterized by scholars as the villain in the story of mass incarceration. That they have their own story and, and, and perspective. So that's been uh, really fascinating for us uh, to talk to the, these people who the policies offend a lot of the things that, that Bill and I are writing about in ages of anxiety, but it's still you know, our responsibility as scholars to understand these uh, human beings as actors, what motivated them, and, and you know, give them the opportunity to kind of uh, speak for themselves as, you know, what they were doing and their take on this history. So that, I, I think, has been uh, illuminating for me. It's, it's harder than when I wrote about the people litigating in Ray Gall, who I all, I like them immensely. I shared a lot of uh, similarities uh, with them, but uh, writing about um, people who, you know, very much, uh, you know, part of law enforcement has been a really interesting, uh, you know, part of the, the new work that I'm doing. And I, I know that's you know, written a lot about interactions of, of police and and, and kids. So, you know, thinking through those issues, um, I think it's enormously important. Yeah, and I would add uh, uh, the project I'm working on right now actually is uh, going to lead to some oral interviews with former prosecutors, and uh, uh, it's a capital punishment study. And I am looking at uh, juveniles and youthful uh, adult offenders, so between the ages of like 18 and 21, uh, who are sentenced to death and whose juvenile records were used against them in making the case for uh, uh, their so-called future dangerousness, which is a Texas invention in the 1970s that was copied in other places, either formally or informally. Um, and uh, again, right before the COVID-19 outbreak, I had just landed uh, uh, a chance to interview a former DA here in San Antonio who prosecuted a very notorious case in the 1980s. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know when I'm going to actually get to sit down and talk to him in person. But uh, uh, these are, uh, this is going to be a, a very sort of deep reading social history uh, type of, of activity where I'm looking not just at the case files, but conducting oral interviews and, and, uh, you know, going in some cases to these sort of rural areas uh, 
and uh, digging into their local uh, archives and newspaper archives to get more kind of sense of, of uh, these individuals and their stories. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess what I'm doing in this particular case is I'm trying to look at how uh, uh, childhood is, is really taken away from uh, these individuals uh, twice, uh, once as children and then a second time as young adults. Uh, and uh, what that means for us from a policy perspective. Uh, so that's the big kind of bigger project that I'm working on now with a couple of these sort of smaller side projects, many of which are informed by the work that we did on ages of anxiety and this, these sort of moral panics questions. I want to thank you so much for the work that you do and um, the inspiration. I think Ages of Anxiety um, has um, a model to offer us and also it takes us to some very interesting um, specific places where we see the interaction of um, young people and experts and the law and um, it's instructive on so many levels. So I want to say um, thanks so much for continuing to be such great um, inspiring um, role models and uh, we really look forward to seeing um, uh, the work that you're doing now and in, in the near future uh, come to fruition. So thanks a lot both of you. Thank you, Thank you. And Tamara. Thank you for listening to Shusai Podcasts. You can find more materials and features from the Society for the History of Children and Youth online shcy.org.